Hello and welcome to the How To Be Good podcast. I'm Gareth and with me as usual is Anka. And this week is International Compost Awareness Week. And with that in mind, we thought we should do a show that was primarily based around composting and the the war against food waste, let's call it. Mm. We, we compost and have our own garden and um, through our journey we soon realized that um, not sending food waste to landfill is, is an important thing that we uh, must all do. Absolutely, and it's something that we can all do relatively easily and make a big difference. I mean, 1.3 million tonnes of, of food is wasted every year. Mm. Indeed, it's a, l- a large amount and uh, that food sent to landfill does not uh, biodegrade as we all think it does. And that's why it's better to keep it uh, at home, compost it or send it to a compost facility near you uh, where it can be properly um, managed and put back into the soil that we really need. And we need to be more aware of the effects of not composting and the effects of anaerobic biodegradation, if that's what you call it, biodegrading, and what that has in terms of effect on the planet. So, I mean, there's 3.3 billion tonnes of CO2 come from food waste um, yearly, which is, which is huge. And not only that, is that when food does degrade uh, anaerobically, if I can get that right, the gas that that gives off is methane, which is much, much worse initially as well as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So to help us with this and to find out more, we were lucky enough to have Hannah Churton, as our guest and she's going to talk about her passion and the passion that she's instilled in others around reducing food waste and composting. And she has set up uh, her little platform called the... The Wormmonger. Let's uh, welcome her to the show. Absolutely. Let's get to it. So hello and welcome to the How To Be Good podcast. I'm here with Hannah Churton, aka The Wormmonger. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us. It's so nice to have every guest on the show and this is going to be no exception at all. So could you please tell us a little bit about yourself? For example, um, where you grew up, where you studied, worked and things like that. A little bit of sort of a backstory. Yeah, sure. I actually grew up on the south coast of New South Wales, a tiny little beach town, which is a pretty idyllic upbringing, actually. And I went on to study, of all things, arts and law. And (laughs) from there, I joined the Australian Foreign Service, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So I worked there for about 10 years and led quite a transient lifestyle. So between Australia and abroad doing foreign and um, international development policy, that was my life for 10 years. So um, it seems like a bit of a stretch then to food waste and compost, but my feeling is that it was always going to to lead me to food waste and compost with me, no matter what I did. (laughs) Sometimes the journey can be strange, but you'll get there in the end. Precisely. Excellent. So you described yourself previously as a compost tragic and an enthusiastic talker. Can you tell us why you describe yourself that way? An enthusiastic trash talker, actually. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Although I can be an enthusiastic talker too. So um, <laughs> stop me where need be. But no, I, I am definitely an enthusiastic trash talker. And I think for me, the reason why I am so enthusiastic about talking about trash is that there just seems to be such a big misconception around composting and food waste, that it's gross, that it's dirty, that it stinks. But Mm -hmm. in actual fact, it's precisely the opposite. The alternative, going to landfill, is gross and it's dirty and it stinks. But yep. compost is about building soil and building life to sustain our plants. So once I 
got into my own composting journey and realized just how easy it is and what a beautiful way um, to build sustainable living it was, I became really enthusiastic about trying to bust those myths (laughs) Uh, I was that type of person who would go along to a party and want to talk about my worm farm, but I realised pretty quickly (laughs) that that often kind of got the old glazed over stare pretty quickly and I realised that people just weren't interested in in it because they just Mm -hmm. thought it was um, getting your hands dirty in a way that they just were not interested in. So for me it was really about busting the myths around compost and its ickiness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So... The Wormmonger. Can you tell us more about sort of the the whole educational platform that that you've set up and what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess for me, it's it's quite multi level. It all started out with the Instagram page, so you know, really, really basic social media, and it was just a way for me. I was living overseas at the time, and it was a way for me to continue communicating my message and to putting that awareness awareness out there. And uh, from there, I guess it really has grown into more of an in real life platform where I'm able to educate at schools, educate businesses, educate communities about how they can do things in their own tiny little patches to dispose of their food waste responsibly and to, to build a sustainable um, place within their own little patch. How have you found the uptake within schools and young children? Kids are just just the best. Kids absolutely <laughs> love worms to start with. So if yeah. you rock up to a school with a handful of worms, you know, you'll have them eating out of your hand uh, almost immediately because they're just, they're just fascinated by nature, little kids. They love bugs and they love getting their hands dirty. And mm-hmm. so introducing them to the idea of sustainable living and circular economy around disposing of our food waste responsibly is really the easiest easiest way to do it it's much much easier than trying to talk adults around because kids are just immediately fascinated absolutely absolutely so what inspired you to take this path or who inspired you yeah that's it's hard for me to kind of you know throw my mind back to where it all started as a kid my parents always had a worm farm so I guess I grew up with that and I guess took it with me into my own life. And as I reached kind of the age where I was, I was starting my own career and becoming professional, I think, I think I left it behind a little bit. It fell by the wayside because I was focusing on other things in life. But um, I was leading a really transient life. As I said before, I, I worked for DFAT for 10 years. And so I led a really transient life and wasn't always in the one place. I was always I was often living in different places, either in Australia or abroad. And I started to garden and I started to compost in conjunction with gardening because what gardening gave me was this sense of home. And I realized that I could I could do it anywhere. I could pick it up anywhere and immediately it gave me this sense of home, this sense of nurturing, this sense of belonging in the space that I was living. I think for me, that's where it started. And from there, it has just blossomed into the glorious thing that it has become for me now. Fantastic. So just in case our listeners aren't sure, could you tell us about compost, what it does and um, what it is? Yeah, for sure. I guess in short, compost, what compost is by definition is decayed organic matter. And so basically anything that is organic can be composted to make an organic matter that then ultimately fertilizes our plants and enriches our soil. That is the most basic description I could give you for compost. And I think with that, um, if we say organic matter, we immediately think about food, but there's other things that we compost as well with our food. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And you may be familiar with the carbon nitrogen ratio that people talk about when it comes to compost so food waste is really nitrogen rich and we need to balance that out with carbon and our carbon sources often aren't food so we could take dry leaves or cardboard or shredded paper egg cartons toilet rolls 
all of those items are compostable organic items and they do a really, really great job of balancing out our nitrogen. Uh, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful marriage that gives us the beautiful end product of compost. Can you tell us more about the importance of composting and the good that it can do to our soil? Yeah, for sure. Uh, composting, for me, the reason why composting is so important is that the statistics tell us that about 40% of our household waste goes to landfill. What most people don't understand about food waste going to landfill is that it decomposes in an anaerobic environment, which causes greenhouse gases and contributes to climate change. So if it decomposes anaerobically, it's giving off methane, which is a greenhouse gas. It also leaks uh, toxins and a leachate, and that goes into our waterways and also uh, taints our soils. So it's, it's a big problem for climate change, uh, and it's also something that is pretty readily reversible. Yeah. yeah. So this week is International Compost Awareness Week. Tell us a little bit more about it and, and, and how you're involved too. Yeah. International Compost Awareness Week is a week purely uh, for raising awareness about compost, just as the name states. So it's a series of activities and events to improve people's awareness around compost and also the importance of compost. If you go onto the Compost Week webpage, compostweek.com.au, uh, you can uh, have a look at what events are available. You can also register your own event and you can participate or follow along on what people are doing around Compost Awareness Week. So they've got their social media, they've got their website and people can log in there and create their own community event uh, about raising awareness for compost. This year, the annual slogan is better soil, better life, better future. And I think that slogan really really beautifully encapsulates what composting is all about. People don't understand that when they're uh, disposing of their food waste responsibly, they're building our soil and building soil is such an important aspect of us going into the future for our farming, uh, for re reversing the impact of climate change and for building a better life for our future. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, it's such a huge difference once we've got healthy soils. Yeah, and I think... For some reason, people don't quite marry up composting with the importance to our agriculture. There seems to be some kind of disconnect there. So building awareness around that is really, really important going forward. Absolutely, absolutely. So have you helped other people through their sort of their composting journey? Perhaps some of these people might be living in a small apartment or a little townhouse with, with very little area. And, and that's it's something we hear a lot. And how do they do it in such small an area? Yeah, absolutely. I have because that's where it all started for me. Living a transient life, I often found that I was living in small spaces. So when I started The Wormmonger, that's what it was about. It was about how people living in small spaces could actually achieve it. And I was doing it myself. I was living it and I was learning it. So The Wormmonger started when I was living in an apartment in Tel Aviv and I had this little rooftop space where I could plant some some plants and the climate there was amazing for growth. So mm -hmm. I planted my little green space in the middle of the city and I had my worm farm going. And from there, I started to use my social media to record what I was doing and to tell other people how they could also do it in a really small space. And I now still live in the city. I live in the suburbs now. So I have a little bit more space to dabble with. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I don't have vast amounts of property to do my hot, hot composting and, you know, run my Berkeley method. Yeah. I'm still composting in, in a pretty compact kind of space. But even if you live in an apartment, there are ways to dispose of your food waste responsibly. And there are some really, really fantastic initiatives around today like Share Waste. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with mm -hmm. Share Waste, but it's a fantastic app where you can find a host to deliver your food scraps to and that host is someone who will compost it on their property and who is seeking out the carbon or the nitrogen source to add to their own mix of glorious compost. 
But if you can't do that, there are also community community gardens and I live in Brisbane and Brisbane is dotted with community gardens and I think our cities are becoming much, much better at that. So, you know, you can look up your local community garden and they will have a compost hub and so you can take your bucket of scraps down to your local compost hub Mm -hmm. and you can hold on to your scraps a little bit longer by freezing them or you can bakashi them and that way you've fermented it and prolonged its life I guess before it rots until you can get it to a source of that will compost it properly for you so there are lots of options and I think our councils are also getting a lot better and a lot more switched on and attuned to what we need to be doing but even without green bin collection service and food and organic waste collections which some councils are already doing in Australia even without that you can still pretty readily dispose of your compost waste responsibly in the city. Yeah. Yeah. What we're noticing lately um, in the last couple of years is how many schools are getting involved as well. So the school have their own garden and have their own composting and, you know, the families of the children quite happily take their their food waste there to be composted. So it's, it's readily available. Yeah, I think that's right. And my own little girls go to a daycare which has that system running uh, and I take the excess for my own compost hub, but they have their they have their worm farm on site. They've got their full garden on site, and so they are demonstrating within their own tiny patch circular economy. Yeah. Uh, and I think that gives us a lot of hope for the future, really, because our kids are learning from a really really young age what circular economy means, and that we can valorize our waste; uh, mm-hmm. that it doesn't need to come to the end of its life once we've yeah. finished with it. Absolutely. And, and that's not just food waste. It's seeing all other wastes as not a waste project, but product, but a, a future use product for something else and, and, and keeping that in the system rather than just having virgin products left, right and centre. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. And I think the younger generation has a much, much better idea of that, even at yeah. a really, really young age. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's let's hope uh, it carries on that way because they're going to be the generation that are going to take us forward. Yeah, that's right. So we often hear that it is too hard, uh, or that people have started composting and given up. What advice do you have for them? Yeah, you're right. That's true, and I think. As we were talking about before around my enthusiasm around compost, I think again this comes down to busting myths around compost. And it is true, once you start composting, you will come up against hurdles, you know. You'll get a stinky compost bin or something will happen that, you know, plants the seed of doubt or fear or that you're not going to be able to to do it. But it's just like anything else. I think you just need to, don't mind the pun, get your hands dirty (laughs) and learn Uh, And as you learn, you will discover that actually a lot of what they say about composting uh, and the difficulty around composting uh, just either doesn't exist or is completely surmountable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of what I teach is around overcoming that fear and understanding that if you make a mistake and if you stuff it up, just start again. The worst yep. thing that can happen in my case is that you, you kill some of your worms and my worms are my babies. But, <laughs> you know, if that's the worst thing that happens, just start again. Buy another box of worms from Bunnings and, and start again and it's just not that big a deal. And the more you kind of observe your compost or your worm farm or your tumbler or whatever system that it is that you're using, to to compost the more you observe and the more you interact with that system the better that you are going to become and the more in tune you're going to become with your your compost yeah absolutely and and i think one of the things i I remember from my childhood uh, my grandparents was that the compost bin used to be way way down right at the end of the garden sort of hidden away and at the end of of the meals and everything okay scrape this go that and then go and take it and you think oh i've got to go all the way down there in the garden in the dark so i think maybe looking at how you locate it so it is readily available to a degree um is also important 
Yeah, I think that's probably right, actually. Because I've always lived in the city setting, I've never actually had my compost too far afield. And on some occasions, I've housed my worms inside because they're very precious and (laughs) they deserve a home indoors as well. So yeah, I have always operated with my compost quite close to me. And I think that's probably right. I think more and more as people are getting their heads around composting in the cities and keeping their food waste at hand, then we have to become more comfortable with uh, having it right there. Yeah, absolutely. And and there seems to be a a, a great... I'm hesitant to say fashion, but I can't think of a better word at the moment for for city gardens and small home gardens and things like that. And so hopefully that perpetuates the whole thing as well. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know. My whole my main aim in life could be to make uh, composting on trend in the city. So if you say that <laughs> it's starting, <laughs> if you say that small gardens are um are becoming fashionable, then I'm halfway there. I rec- I reckon, but I reckon Absolutely. also COVID did a lot to to encourage that because people spent a lot longer in their homes and they also started to turn their attention a lot to how they were living and how they could be a little bit more responsible when it comes to, say, the provenance of their food, where their food was coming, who they were buying it from, whether or not they could grow their own even. Mm. And that means that then it's it's a really small, short kind of link up then to composting because the moment you start thinking about growing your own food is the moment that you start thinking about the quality of the soil that you're using and you know even that if that extends to the quality of the soil that your local farmer is using because that's now where you're buying your produce then that's a Mm. beautiful thing absolutely and i think you're absolutely right i mean when when the first wave of lockdowns hit here we built ourselves i i forget the size but it was a big greenhouse i think it was, it was like six by three or greenhouse at the end of the garden and then started growing all of our veggies there and and it was and the kids got involved so I, it was it was good i i you know i look look at it fondly as as, as an achievement that was done through covid19 yeah i definitely think it's been a covid silver lining if we were to talk of the good things that have come out of COVID, I think definitely people, if they didn't start their own gardens, they certainly started to turn their attention to where their food was coming from and how they could make that aspect of their life a lot more sustainable. In my own home, I was already composting and had a bit of a garden going, but, you know, I started to do things like meal planning and just being really, really conscious of the food that I was buying and the food that I was using so I could be a lot more efficient with the use of my food. Absolutely. And and having kids, uh, you you said you've got two girls Um, and we've got three boys, so having having kids makes you aware of the waste that can happen with the food. I mean, don't get me wrong. Sometimes our, our kids are completely ravenous and they, we can't feed them enough. But then there's other times when they're just, they're just not going to have it. So it's, it's, it's good to be able to recycle that, so to speak, or compost it. Totally it is. I mean, I spend my life banging on about <laughs> reducing food waste. I am one of the world's greatest offenders because I have two <laughs> toddlers at home who... <laughs> will invariably refuse the first four meals I offer them. (laughs) So (laughs) there's just no avoiding food waste in my household. And, you know, it doesn't matter how conscious we are of the food that we're eating and consuming and, you know, how great our meal planning is, we're always going to have a little bit of waste. So Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we we hear a lot from um, friends and colleagues about – them feeling powerless and th- thinking that their their efforts or their intentions are not worth it because they're not doing enough, not, they're not changing enough. Uh, what what do you think about this and what would you like to say to these people that are trying or thinking to, to compost, but uh, they think that that change is not going to be enough to, to help our, uh, our climate change? Fight. Yeah, I think that's a really easy headspace to get into. And I think we've all been there, you know, just that moment where you just feel like, oh, it's hopeless and it doesn't matter how much I do, it's got not going to make an impact. But for me, the thing that really kind of switched my thinking on this came again during COVID. I really had a breakthrough moment there because I started a compost hub out of my own carport 
and I sent flyers around to all my neighbours and told them that I would be starting to compost on my property and that they were welcome to send their scraps to me. I really had no expectation about what would become of this. I really didn't even think anyone would participate. I'm fairly new to the area in which I live, so I don't really know my neighbours. I wasn't particularly enthusiastic. And then something really, really glorious happened in that people came out of the woodwork and within six months I had composted a tonne of waste <laughs> from my own street. <laughs> wow. And people were so enthusiastic about it. I just couldn't believe the enthusiasm that came out of the street. And mm -hmm. uh, I met all of my neighbours. I built this beautiful community around my neighbours all because I started this compost hub and I just had no no idea that starting something on such a grassroots kind of basis could have that kind of impact. So for me now, that was just a real light bulb moment for me around the impact of community and how even a really small community, in my case, one single street can mm. have a huge impact. And we now compost the waste from our street. I process that waste and then I give it back to the community from which it has come. So people who want the compost back can take it. And I've built a community garden out the front of my place where the community can take what they need from the garden that they have built from their own food scraps. Mm. So the community just keeps building and building. I've now signed up to Share Waste as a host, so now people can contribute from outside of my street. Yeah. But, you know, ultimately it started from this, this tiny little idea in the deep, dark depths of COVID-19 lockdown 1.0. Mm -hmm. And that's what community can build. Yep. Fantastic. Yeah. And the other great thing about it is that uh, I don't sell the compost back to the community, but I do seek a donation from people who, who mm -hmm. want it back. And so we're now also making regular donations to a small grassroots waste management organisation called Waste oh, wow. Aid, which builds waste management systems in Indigenous communities in Australia. So it's kind of multi, it's become this beautiful multi-level community building building exercise fantastic so tell us about your shared street garden um, I, you told us that you've built this in front of your uh, house um have your neighbors joined in with their own little community gardens at the, at the front are they coming to use the produce and yeah how does that work yes they are and actually some of my neighbors have also started their own little shared sites out the front of their house or are letting their neighbours know when they've got excess herbs or something excess that's growing in their own gardens. So it's it's become bigger than what I've offered out the front of my own home, which fantastic. is fantastic. People are really understanding the idea of sharing and and growing for community rather than just mm -hmm. individualistic purposes. Yeah, I will note that the shared garden that I was able to build out the front of my own home was already established as a, it was just a native grass kind of patch out the front. Mm -hmm. So I pulled those native grasses out and planted a whole heap of herbs and seasonal veggies and stuff in there. But I think there is an issue ordinarily around getting council approval to put something in on your verge. So yeah. you do have to be careful about that. I'm usually one for asking for forgiveness rather than permission. So you might be able to go that route, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't me who told you to do that. And <laughs> it is really, really useful to know that councils do have requirements around verge gardens yeah. and anything that lies outside of your front gate. So just be mindful of that if you're thinking about putting it in. I don't yeah. say that to discourage you. No. <laughs> Do it anyway. Ask for forgiveness. <laughs> yeah, it tends to be our path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're also doing your PhD as well. 
I am. I am doing my PhD. Yet again, another COVID silver lining for me because um, I was due to go back to work following maternity leave from my little girl and I just was feeling slightly anxious about what the opportunities would be and I'd relocated to a new city so I couldn't go back to my previous job and I just didn't know what opportunities were going to present themselves. So I started to really look outside the box, which I think <laughs> is we don't often allow ourselves to do that. And for me and I think for a lot of others, COVID did allow us to look outside the box a little bit and to also question what was really important to us. And I had the opportunity to do that and started to think about the avenues that I could, could take my career. And, yeah, I've dived in to do a PhD in... Um, what other than food waste? So it's a little bit of a divergence from my previous career, but <laughs> I think, you know, having learnt over the past few years that my passion really lies in the compost, then it was absolutely a worthwhile step for me to take. So I'm looking at the policy barriers actually around um, valorizing food waste and how we as a yeah. nation can do it a lot better. All right. And so is. Is that something in terms of valorising food waste, is that sort of a council or government-led type of thing that would be acted on later on? Yes. Yes, it is. So I guess we have frameworks and policies and regulations at the federal and the state and the local council level. So it's quite a complex policy landscape and complex policy landscapes can become quite problematic in, in mm -hmm. ultimately getting things done. And Australia as a nation has a target of reducing our food waste by 50% by 2030. And if we're going to achieve that goal, then we need to smarten up our act. And mm -hmm. some of that will be around how we can improve uh, our policy and our regulation to to open the path for people to to innovate and to to go into business and to uh, build the technology that we need to become better at either either composting or turning our waste into energy or yep. whatever it might be to repurpose our and recycle our food waste absolutely i mean I've done previously and still do a lot of work for large retail shopping centers and things like that. And one of the things that I was always astounded by was the amount of food waste that those shopping centers generate. And yet it would be a reasonably simple option to have the electronic type composting thing, the very large industrial scale side of things, be able to, to, to reduce that as well, or even set up a scheme to divert it directly. Um, and yet it still seems to be a very big hurdle. I think the only thing that, that I managed to get achieved was was to be able to separate the cooking oils to be taken off to be reused. Um, but apart from, apart from that, the food waste just, yeah, it seems to be a big issue. Yeah, it is a big issue. Thankfully, with some of the big supermarkets, they've now signed on to organisations like Oz Harvest, who mm -hmm. take the yeah. edible food waste and yeah. um, repurpose that by um, giving it to those in need. So that's one really great avenue. But, you know, as you've suggested, there are all sorts of points along the supply chain where the food breaks down so it's no longer edible and what are you doing with that and how mm -hmm. can we overcome these hurdles and and we need to because it's 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 not only our a, a national goal but we've got an international obligation mm -hmm. against the sustainable de development goals also to reduce our food waste and to become better absolutely so looking sort of back at your community garden have you sort of put something together sort of to give people ideas on how they could set it up for themselves or, or do you coach people in that? Yes, I do. Uh, a lot of that, I guess, has just come from my Instagram platform really uh, because I'll often promote awareness of my community garden and my compost hub on mm -hmm. that on that platform and I'm just finding that people come out of the woodwork to me to say, how can I do that? How are you doing this? How does it work? Can you show me be a behind the scenes? 